This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Here, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Lucia Carboni, who really doesn't need much of an introduction, I'm sure. She is our um, Andrew Burnett, Associate Curator of Roman Coins. Um, she has been publishing a great deal on um, late, uh, later Hellenistic, early Republican coinages of various sorts, Roman and um, coinages like the Sistophora coinages that sort of bridge the gap between the Roman and the Greek worlds. Um, and I also just want to put in a plug for um, her latest article, which is going to appear in the ANS magazine, which should be arriving on your doorsteps um, momentarily if it hasn't already. Uh, this is something uh, entitled um, Women, Power, and Civil Wars, A Tale in Roman Coins. But today, um, she's going to be talking about another forthcoming publication, which uh, focuses on a collection of coins that was donated to the American Numismatic Society uh, by Rick Wachonki, who sadly died um, back in 2015. And um, he had amassed this collection of roughly 4,000 coins with the intent of um, using these as the basis for something we sort of call internally RPC0. And I'm sure Lucia is going to be telling me more about that. So um, it is my great pleasure, Lucia, to turn it over to you. and. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this very kind, uh, kind introduction, first of all. And um, the Wichonke Cadillac, I want to say, is really going now to the press uh, next week, uh, or uh, anyway, it's now really finally been published. Uh, and you will see that, of course, I didn't do all this uh, work on my own. Uh, I'll, I'll see, and I and I see that I, some fellow contributors are already on this call uh, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, and since I have, uh, so thank you, I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you for being here. And uh, I'll now begin sharing uh, uh, my screen and telling you what this is about. Now, since uh, this is a huge uh, catalog, today I will be only talking about part of it which is the West. I will be focusing on the West. And then in 2024, I think on March 1st or earlier, if there is any cancellation, I will uh, talk about the East. It simply wouldn't make any justice to this incredible collection we have here if I were to try to compress everything in one. So I'll, I'll just begin sharing my screen. That's why today we have the West. And you see this is the cover of uh, the Wuchonke catalog. And as you see, I was not the only one here working. I'm the main author, but you can see that Oliver Hoover, Suzanne Frey Cooper, Clive Stannard, Sofia Cremidi, Federico Carbone, uh, David Handing, and Liv, Maria, uh, Liv Yarrow uh, contributed to this as well. And also we have special contribution from Alice Sharpless, uh, and uh, Doug Wong. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all of them. And also I wanted to also, sorry, but this is necessary uh, to thank uh, other people like uh, Pere Pauri Bolles, uh, who helped me a lot <laughs> with the chapters on Spain and Spanish imitations, uh, uh, Olivia Legrand for uh, Roman Republican coinage, Miguel Asolati for uh, Crete and Cyrenaica, and Stefan Martin uh, for the Celtic coinage. So, I mean, this is absolutely necessary because without them it would have been a little bit difficult. Okay, so you know all Rick uh, and uh, um, uh, Peter has already spoken about him. He's, uh, of course, the one who actually introduced me during my summer seminar where I was a gra graduate student to this coinage and to the Sistophori. So, I mean, uh, is super important because really not only because he's the one then uh, through which we got this collection and is a great friend to many of us uh, but to me he was actually the one who gave me this idea of beginning working on this so very happy and of course we organized already a, a conference back in 2021 on this now i will use exactly this uh, uh, this sentence uh, 
from uh, Crawford, uh, Michael Crawford, which I think is the one who encapsulates uh, all this idea of RPC zero, so which is which are the coinages uh, who um, are issued in the early Roman provinces, which means uh, uh, before the 40s BC, when uh, basically the RPC, the Roman provincial coinage, by convention, let's say, conventionally, is beginning. So, uh, of course, the, RB, the RBW collection also includes uh, some of the RPC specimens, but I will be mostly, or today I will be focusing on the second and early first century BC, which is not covered by RPC. And the huge thing is that, as you see, as uh, Crawford says, for the fact that the Romans did not export their own carnage into the Greek world, does not mean that their presence had no effect on existing monetary patterns. And I would say it's not only the Greek world, it's the Celtic world, uh, as we will see today, uh, is the world even of the populations outside of the Limes, uh, like the Dacian tribes, the Epraviscan uh, tribes. So it's really uh, an incredibly interesting world. So um, this is, of course, uh, a slide that, I, that, of course, I owe this to François de Calatay to give you this idea, but we will talk more about this, of course, during the East, about the, all these coinages that don't look Roman, but are so actually right. Roman. But, but this will be mostly part, uh, actually, this will be addressed next, uh, uh, in, the next, um, in the next long table. Uh, I want here to uh, quote uh, this entire paragraph. I mean, I will not read it uh, all. Uh, about uh, uh, written by Andrew Burnett, by to whom and to Michel Amandria, I also owe a lot of uh, gratitude, a huge uh, token of gratitude, because they were, of course, part of the sine qua non for RPC together with Peri Pari Bolas, but also they actually read this catalog at different stages and offered incredibly valuable feedback. So, as you see, this work and a new approach seem very familiar now, is the approach of the RPC. But here, uh, Andrew Burnett says something which is absolutely fundamental, which is this idea of a Roman provincial coinage sometimes is very specific, and we sometimes just focus on specific region, forgetting all the relationship between different provinces. For example, when we talk, uh, when we speak about uh, custodial coinage in Macedonia, uh, we hardly ever think about uh, uh, the custodial coinage in Sicily, or uh, all of this, which is super interesting, and where we talk about the disappearing of civic coinage in the eastern, uh, in Asia Minor, we don't think that, for example, Italy, which is not a province, but anyway, Italy and the West went through the same exact process just one century before that, earlier. So it's very interesting when you see and you can match and compare these two different parts of the empire, these different provinces, and that's what we're trying to do today. Uh, this is, the, of course, the Chunky collection as it was. So, the Wichonke catalog is 36 sections, and great importance is given to Celtic coinages, which is really revolutionary in some way, because uh, Rick began collecting Celtic coinages in 1986, so right after the publication of uh, uh, Crawford's book, of course, on coinage in the Mediterranean, and uh, it was really inspired by this. Um, we will, of course, uh, uh, talk about very important non-state coinages and uh, the imitations. There will be another part. Uh, also, uh, the typological and geographical and organizational criteria of the catalog. So it means that mostly the catalog follows the RPC, okay, RPC organization, territorial organization, but in some cases for some very <coughs> coinages, <coughs> which are very 
which, which we have a high number, for example, the fleet coinage or the Sistofori, for example, this collection, which is uh, 3,727 coins, uh, has, for example, 800 Sistofori. So, of course, the Sistofori needed to be put on their own because they're just too many. So, generally, we follow geographical organization, but we also have some exception for typology. And we decided to include uh, uh, Roman and Italian coinage, uh, even if uh, clearly it's not part, probably, of provincial coinage, especially colonial coinages and unofficial issues that, of course, are part in some way of these non state coinages, which we will talk about. So, these are Basically, this is how the RBC, RBW catalog has been organized in general. So we'll begin with the West. And, uh, okay, just, okay, I, I could not, <laughs> uh, okay. We have the first 12 sections uh, of the catalog are dedicated to so-called Western provinces. And here we have uh, the uh, we will see that we will first address uh, the convergence toward Roman denominations and the gradual disappearance of local silver in Western provinces. And, uh, of course, this will happen in the East as well, just later. We will uh, uh, address the appearance of Roman magistrates on local bronze coinage. We will address also imitations and non-state coinages. So this will be the three main parts of my presentation today. I will uh, mostly show you coins from the uh, Wichonke collection. And of course, uh, if uh, uh, the authors of specific sections want them to say something, they are very, very welcome. Allah, so um, I will begin, uh, uh, I will begin exactly with the convergence towards Roman denominations degrees in local coinage, you see this uh, incredibly beautiful obverse of this coin. Uh, we will talk about this coin specifically. Uh, is a coin, um, a coin from Gaul, and uh, here you can see Quintus Qu Doci written. Uh, of course, this Doci, whoever he was, was probably a chieftain, but you can see that he has the Roman prenomen which really gives the idea of this, uh, um, uh, of this uh, mix, let's say, of Roman characters and local characters, which is exactly this idea of the local coinages in a Roman world. And this uh, open-mouthed female face uh, is actually Rome. So believe it or not, it's an interpretation, local interpretation of Rome. So I will begin with Spain. And... Uh, um, of course, uh, Spain, uh, after the conquest by the Romans, uh, uh, was divided in ulterior and quiterior, and then under Augustus uh, was, farther, uh, was uh, divided in Bedica, uh, Lusitania, etc. But I will, uh, uh, this was when most of the coinages that um, we will be addressing were issued. This was the, um, the division of Spain, the two provinces of Spain during the, the, the Republic. Um, now, after, the, after Spain, the, actually, the Iberian Peninsula became a Roman province, uh, uh, Roman denominations were introduced uh, pretty soon. Mm? Even if, uh, and what we will see, is that there was, of course, a resistance, especially in ulterior, uh, which will then become mostly Lusitania, um, to, uh, to Roman denominations. But what is also super interesting is that uh, even in the cases uh, where, which was much, much more common in the Citerior, where Roman denominations were introduced already in the second century BC, you have uh, the permanence uh, of uh, local types. 
as you can see, for example, in this coin of Obulco, uh, which is an ass, a Roman ass, but you can see that it maintains basically the, uh, the original script, the Iberian script, uh, and local types. Now, I will begin showing you then uh, um, a coin from uh, uh, Castulo, for example. So here we have uh, a coin from uh, Castulo uh, issued uh, right before, let's say, um, during, sorry, the Punic War. So you can see these are the typical, uh, um, these are the typical types, uh, sorry, of uh, Castulo. So, oh, with this male face, uh, here I'll try to put it in focus, better focus, let's see. There you go. Okay. With this uh, male, male head uh, with the tenia, and then you have uh, this bull uh, with the crescent, and here is written uh, in uh, Iberian characters, Castulo. But what is super interesting uh, is that Castulo then uh, right afterwards, like few, di just uh, around uh, um, in the second century, in the, sa in the beginning, uh, in the yeah, uh, middle second century BC, um, switched, let's say, to Latin script and adopted uh, the Roman denominations system, okay? And we will talk about this, but the Roman denominations were issued pretty earlier. But you see that Castulo maintained, and this maintained really until the end of the first century BC, the local types. So uh, the... Um, the male head with the, uh, with the crown, let's say, and then you see the bull with the crescent. But here you see, for example, the appearance, as you can see, of the name of uh, local magistrates, and local magistrates coexisting still with Iberian scripts. So you really see how this coinage is strongly influenced by the Romans. Another one that I want to show you, and then I, I will go back to my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, of course, you also have, for example, this is a coin by Carteia, okay? Uh, Carteia was uh, a very important, was a very early colony of, uh, uh, of the Romans. So, and Carteia, probably because it was a colony of the Romans, immediately, uh, not only um, in Carteia there is a coinage like this one, some issues like this one, this is clearly a semis, uh, okay? And you can see clearly that is a semis here, but you, you read Carteia, and uh, um, so in Cartaglia, since it's a colony, you have not only the adoption of Roman type, uh, Roman denominations, but also Roman types. At the same time, even a colony like Cartaglia go on, went on issuing coins with civic types. Um, I'll just go on, sorry, and I'll just put again my screen my PowerPoint on. These are the ones. Uh, one thing, the Wichonke collection does not have, unfortunately, any of these fantastic Iberian denarii. Uh, we have one or two in our collection at ANS, but what is super, super interesting is that at the same time when uh, uh, all this local bronze was issued, uh, on Roman denomination, the basis of Roman denomination, following Roman denominations, Roman denominations were also um, adopted for silver, actually much, much earlier on. And these are the so-called Iberian denarii that according 
for example, to Peribao Ripoll less uh, were probably um, issued uh, under some supervision of the Roman governors, in the same way that we will see happening for uh, provincial silver coinages in the East afterwards. So it's very, very interesting. Of course, in other areas, for example, in all the uh, areas, of course, of the ulterior, there is also a resistance to Roman denominations. Uh, I just wanted to show you this other beautiful coin uh, of Cartaya, and then we will move, uh, because we have so much to see. I'll just stop sharing and show you directly this coin. Uh, and you see Valentia. This is another, of course, a Roman colony. On the other side, you clearly recognize the head of Rome. Now. We will have, for example, Valentia, this, uh, this cornucopia with all these arrows, uh, will, be, will, stay, um, will stay a local type, a civic badge of Valentia, for example, until the times uh, of Sertorius. We have uh, some coinage uh, issued with no mint name, what is probably during the times, for example, the occupation of Sertorius, so we are in the early 70s BC, and clearly we have to think that this was Valentia. Okay, so I'll just go on with my PowerPoint again, and uh, this I showed you, and we will go to gold. So you see Gallia at the times of Caesar. We will talk over, of course, be also before the times of Caesars, even if most of the coins we're going to address today, only for Gallia actually, have been included uh, in, um, in RPC. But uh, Rick had such an interest in them that I think it was needed to, it's important to just mention this. So, Caesar talks about the Sequani, the tribe of the Sequani, as friends of the Romans. And of course, the Sequani were highly Romanized. And I will show you exactly some uh, coins uh, of the Sequani. So I'll just, again, stop sharing my screen here. And I'll show you, for example, uh, these uh, Quintus, uh, Quintus Doci, I mean, this Q is for sure. Uh, Allah, first of all, what is important here to say is that uh, this foreign-looking uh, foreign coin is actually um, a denomination that is entirely compatible uh, with the Roman system, because this is a so-called denier galois, and this denier galois is basically a quinarius. So this was entirely compatible. They didn't circulate together, this we know, but anyway, um, anyway, this was entirely compatible. And you can see here uh, the, the head of Rome, as I said, together with the Q, which tells us that this was uh, this chieftain, probably, I mean, this monier, possibly a chieftain, was actually uh, Roman. And you can see here a typical uh, uh, Celtic, okay, uh, this uh, Celtic uh, um, uh, type, you know, the Monet, Monet à Chevalier, but also, of course, uh, all the, uh, the types that we also see in the Celtiberian, in Celtiberian coinage. And you see the repetition here of Quintus uh, Dodges. Doci or Docius, we, I mean, we don't know, of course. Um, I also want you to want to show you again uh, here another super super interesting coin, uh, also um, issued by the Sequani, and uh, you see uh, again possibly the head of Rome, and here you read the name of uh, this uh, chieftain. This chieftain is uh, Togi Rix, okay? Rix uh, clearly is like Vercingetorix, of course has to do with uh, Rex, it's the, uh, the chieftain of the tribe. And always uh, the, and this is another 
uh, then uh, another, of course, beautiful, according to me, uh, horse. But, and this is something I, for which I need to resume my PowerPoint. Sorry for this uh, back and forth. You can see here the possible Roman model for this uh, coin. And this is Togirix. But what is super interesting is that uh, in another, uh, in another uh, series, uh, this in this case, in another series that unfortunately is not included in the Wichonke collection, that's why I cannot show you the coin, you can clearly read that the name of this Togirix was, uh, um, the nomen, let's say, of this Togirix was Iulus. So Togirix, uh, so one uh, of the chieftains probably of the Sequani, of course in this case in the 50s, so we are much later compared to the Spanish uh, the coins, that the Iberian coins that we've seen, was actually one of the Iuli, which means he was given citizenship by Julius Caesar. For example, we have here from this fantastic book of Stéphane Martin, which is exactly talks about the, pa the transition from the stater for France, sorry, from Easter Gaul, from, Fran from the stater to the denarius, you can see all the attestation of the Iuli. So how actually Julius Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar uh, bestowed the citizenship uh, on uh, clearly the Gallic elite in order to foster support uh, to him. And so this Julius Togirix uh, that we saw represented on this, the, um, this uh, Denier Galois was actually one of the Juli. So it was okay. Now I will show you another fantastically looking coin a little bit a few decades earlier. Uh, by the Allobro, uh, by the Allobrogi, I'll just stop sharing here, and there you go. Yeah, this is fantastic. I love it too. A lot. Look at this. Uh, here, you it's much more recognizable. You can re clearly recognize here uh, the uh, helmeted head of Rome. You also have an attempt on an actual inscription Roma, and you have here again. I mean, we know that you have, uh, you have uh, uh, the knight, no? the Monaille Chevalier. But what you have here is this name, Vol. In other ones, uh, you have uh, Cneus Vol, which has been interpreted as Cneus Voluntilus, uh, which was one of the chieftains, clientes of Pompey. So once again, you see how uh, incredibly Roman, actually, these coins uh, were. Okay, I'll, I'll just go on sharing my screen here. Um, then, for example, uh, uh, you have uh, the Edwi, uh, the Edwi, other fratres and consanguinei of the Romans. And it's true that the, Ro the Edwi were actually the first ones, as far as we know, to adopt uh, uh, Roman uh, types. Basically, this is uh, the famous Caletedu uh, series, which is a series 120, so it's much earlier than the ones we've seen. Now, um, I will also show you uh, some, just another coins, uh, just few more coins, because goal, because we are, of course, uh, running out of time, as always, uh, but there's so much to see. Um, in Nemausus, Nim, that then, of course, uh, will, uh, uh, will be the one issuing enormous amount of uh, Roman provincial coinage, uh, beginning with Augustus and so. Uh, but uh, you can see here uh, the original civic types, uh, and I will show you a very rare obol, so silver obol, so that was, so in this case, uh, very interesting, this, uh, which was anyway a colony, um, a Roman colony, as you can see, still you can see it's following actually a Greek, uh, a Greek denominational system. So you can read here, 
name called also Colonia, of course, Colonia Nemosensis, which was the name, of course, of Nemausus. But on this other side, in spite of the fact that this is a silver coin on a Greek denominational system, you can see that these can be um, interpreted as uh, the head of Rome, the helmeted head of Rome. And in this case, we are, again, we are in the 40s BC, so it's pretty, pretty late in some way. And I also want to show you uh, this uh, other very nice coin. In this case, it's from Cabello. It's another obol, so again, Fun, this is sincerely much more beautifully made, Cabello, another Roman colony and another obol, so following the Roman denominational system, but you can see, and you can see here, this is amazing, the name of, uh, fuck, just better like this, okay, the name of uh, Lepidus. Lepidus of the second triumvirate. So it's really beautiful to see this combination of uh, very, very barbaric looking coins uh, and you still have, and you have all these Roman names uh, well into uh, the 40s. Uh, last thing that I want to show you for goal and then we will resume our PowerPoint. Uh, is this, uh, this is one of my favorite. Ah, okay. First of all, look at this, the beauty of the representation here of this elephant. Clearly, whoever, uh, whoever uh, the, the die cutter did this had no idea of uh, an elephant. And, uh, uh, but if you turn this around, uh, you can clearly see what was the model for this, which were the famous this RRC 449, the famous uh, uh, the denarius uh, issued by Julius Caesar in 49. I don't know if that's the right name, but anyway, it was the one issued by Caesar in 49. And even if you cannot see it here, here is, uh, this is a coinage issued in the name of Aulus Hirtius. Aulus Hirtius is, uh, was one of the legati of Caesar in Gaul. He was the one who prob possibly wrote the eighth book of the Bellum Gallicum, so finished the Bellum Gallicum. He's also the one uh, who died uh, together with his fellow uh, consul, Pansa, in 43 in Modena. So we know who he is. And again, look at this beautiful little bronze coin issued uh, in uh, Gallia, clearly uh, following the model of a uh, silver denarius which was circulating in, uh, in Gallia in the name of Aulus Hirtius. But, and last one for Gallia, this is just too fun, but we have so many of them, is uh, this other one, let me see if this is the one, no, this is another one, sorry. Yes, now I think it's this one. Okay, so you can see here. Okay, no, this is not the one I think. Yes. Okay. Voilà. Perhaps you won't read it uh, well here, but this is, uh, yeah, yes, you can see that. Look. Can you read uh, here? at least Hirtius. This is another coin uh, issued in the name uh, of uh, Aulus uh, Hirtius. Again, the legatus of Caesar, but this is the best part. On the other side, uh, you see the name, this is Ini Tucrix, uh, is uh, the name of the chieftain who actually issued the coin. So please uh, look at this fantastic thing, and this bronze coinage does not follow. On the contrary, the, this bronze coinage in gold, even in the, um, 
second half of the first century BC, so basically pre-Augustus, pre-second triumvirate, it does not follow a Roman denominational system. While, of course, silver, in some way, with these few exceptions that I showed, still following the Greek system, are actually following the Roman system, not issuing denarii as, for example, uh, Spain was doing, like Iberia, the, the Iberia, uh, this, uh, yes, the Iberia were doing, but uh, uh, it was, uh, the Spain, sorry, was doing, but uh, they were issuing these uh, on sort of quinarius standard, which is the same anyways, compatible. Okay, so I'll just resume uh, this because it's really important. Uh, so these are the coins I showed you, of course, uh, and the Roman magistrates on local bronze coin, coinage. I will begin uh, uh, briefly talking about uh, uh, Italy. Um, uh, so, of course, we have the very important uh, uh, coinage of Pestum. Um, now, Pestum has an important uh, uh, coinage, I mean, copious coinage, uh, that was already uh, addressed, uh, whose, and its coinage was already addressed by uh, Crawford back in 1973, where uh, he said and talked about uh, the importance of Pestum, and he thought that these copious issues of Pestum must have been, should be seen as a sort of auxiliary coinage for, uh, uh, for Rome. Because as we will see, I mean, Romans apparently did not care that much for uh, small change. So the colony of Pestum was, uh, was instituted in 273 uh, BCE. And uh, I will uh, show you some of the coins of Pestum, which clearly show the fact that, uh, uh, of course, Pestum being a Roman colony, I'll show you the coins, Pestum being a Roman colony, immediately, um, immediately um, uh, adopted, uh, adopted the Roman denominational system, as you can see here, you have a quadrant. But of course, you see that even in this case, uh, you have, of course, especially in the, you see in the reverse, uh, the maintenance of the of the original sorry of the civic types okay of course later on for later ones we have uh, the appearance for example of the names of uh, local magistrates that you can read up there, but you recognize the prow, of course, the Roman prow here. So the coinage of Pestum, so this is Semis, the coinage of Pestum began looking more and more like a Roman one, with some actually exceptions that I will show you uh, in a second. Okay, for example, here you have really the name of uh, here of the Duoviri of Pestu. You can read here Duoviri, which were of course the magistrates, uh, the local magistrates which were running Pestum, being a colony. Uh, but uh, um, in the later uh, the last uh, uh, bronze coinage issued by Pestum was issued under Tiberius. So Pestum went on issuing coinage for a very long, uh, uh, a very long time. Uh, but uh, uh, beginning uh, in the late first century BC, uh, we see appearing uh, on Pestum coinage also the name, not only the names of magistrates, but interestingly enough, uh, the names of uh, local uh, benefactors. For example, Pestum is actually the only uh, coin, uh, the only 
uh, this issue that I'm going to show you now, uh, let's see if you can see it, uh, not well. Okay, yes. Here you can see the portrait of a woman that has a nodus that somehow, I mean, looks like, that, that resembles uh, the one of uh, uh, Livia, Augustus' wife. And in this case, uh, this, the name of this woman was Mineia, and she is uh, really uh, the only one, the only benefactress, basically, the only woman benefactor whose portrait appears on a coin. This is really the only one, as far as I know. If you have other examples, please let me know. We have several other names of uh, women benefactresses whose name appears on coinage. Not in the West, uh, of course also because in the West provincial coinage ends very soon, uh, but in the East. But this is the only, only uh, examples we have on actual portrait uh, and here, oh, on the uh, on the reverse, uh, you can see this basilica, basilica publica, that possibly was actually quite certainly was restored, renovated, uh, renovated with Mineia's uh, money. Um, also, okay, I'll just resume. Very, I'm sorry that I'm just jumping from uh, one uh, uh, coinage. Uh, uh, to the other. Uh, as I say, you will see, uh, of course, uh, I just want to give you uh, the highlights of this, or at least uh, creating a sort of uh, fil rouge, a trait d'union, a sort of thread that can unify all these different kind of coinages, and I want to give you some highlights. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, each of these uh, coinages it's worth of decades, okay, of work, as uh, some of my fellow contributors dedicated to each of these coinages. For example, uh, the most updated uh, uh, catalog of uh, uh, Pestum coinage has been done by Federico Carbone, um, and uh, also with the contribution of Renata Cantilena, but Federico for sure is the main expert on this, so. Now, uh, another fantastic thing is that the Uchonke collection, as you know, is the one that contributes most. So, like the Uchonke collection has more coins from this colony of Copia, which is sort of mysterious, uh, than previously known. So basically adds enormous amount of types, as you see the new types from the Uchonke collection, and uh, I just want to show you, these are incredibly rare coins. Okay, I, I mean, and this is really another of the incredible contribution. You see that uh, I mm, stop sharing here and show you some of these coins. The coins of Copia, it's pretty important, Copia, of course, abundance, uh, was, uh, um, Founded uh, um, in 194 BC on the site uh, of former Sibari, Turi, so a very famed, okay, very famed place. And now you can see that um, um, now the coinage of Copia, for what we know, for example, from excavation, especially the excavation in Castiglione delle Paludi. Uh, which have been supervised by Annalisa Polosa of the Sapienza in Rome, uh, is probably short-lived in some way, just 20 or, 30, uh, 20, 20 or 30 years. It's not like the coinage of Pestum. Uh, I would like, of course, his copia, so the civic badge of the colony. Okay, it's clearly the cornucopia uh, with the uh, ear of corn. And you can see that you have the name of questors that we have to imagine, of course, were local magistrates, but you can clearly see the appearance of these names. And these are 
Roman denominations now copy, uh, adopts uh, all uh, the obverses of Roman denominations, which means uh, Janus, uh, uh, Janus, Mercury, with the exception of the semis, so you cannot see it, uh, because the semis, for the semis that you can see clearly, semis, uh, maintains uh, the civic, uh, maintains this uh, uh, civic, uh, specific type, the civic type that has been interpreted as uh, the tuke, the tuke of, uh, uh, of the city. And I just want to show you another one. Please notice, by the way, the incredible quality, if you compare to what we've seen, uh, what we've seen, for example, for the Pestum coinage, of this coinage of Copia. And please notice uh, the fact that Copia, uh, in the course of the second century BC, maintains uh, this very interesting the uh, P, the Greek P, and also in some issues, the first issues of Pestum, we have this appearance uh, of uh, uh, the P. But of course, in, in copy, it will stay on for the rest of the, um, for all the, here you, you see, this is a quadrants. Uh, so you can clearly see here, Hercules, I told you that you have basically all the obverses of copy and coinages have the Roman denominational types. Uh, with the exception of the semis, and then you see again the in this case you have own idealis, mm? and we know that Suzanne, that I can see here, also thinks that uh, not only Westores but for example other magistrates like Adilis perhaps were the ones responsible for uh, some coinage in Sicily, which we will address in a second. Okay, so let me just move on here. Okay, so you see here again uh, um, the quadrants and the sextants, uh, all uh, the nominational system in Copia. Now, uh, Sicily here, these are clearly slides uh, from uh, uh, Suzanne, and Suzanne is in Port Zanfre Cooper, is also the one responsible for. Uh, the section on Sicily of the Wichonke catalog, and uh, here I'm um, using here and crediting he her with this slide that she presented back uh, in 2021 with the map of Sicily, because of course uh, uh, the uh, the western part of Sicily was province Roman province from 241 BC, and from 221 BC we have here the eastern province. Now Suzanne. Uh, uh, change completely the chronology and the way we think about uh, Sicilian coinage, uh, as you see, as you will see from uh, the catalog, and uh, also changed the chronology uh, here. And what is very interesting, I mean, uh, we unfortunately do not have the time. I'll, I'll show some coins uh, among the coins which were already indicated by uh, among the coins uh, that. Uh, are perhaps most representative of this chronological and typological uh, division here. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we have here some uh, uh, coins that I want to show you that really are the ones that she uh, indicated. And uh, of course, Suzanne. Please feel free to uh, add anything if you like, because uh, this is clearly your work. And uh, uh, for example, here, Suzanne, uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, stop sharing, showed us uh, this super interesting coin, okay? This coin issued by Porcius, but here you can see, so like the very interesting element, uh, I mean, among the very interesting elements uh, is that this uh, Sicilian coinage uh, has uh, the appearance uh, of uh, Roman magistrates. Possibly these have to do with the organization of the province 
I mean, I'm just uh, repeating uh, uh, what Suzanne said. And uh, uh, what is interesting here, as I said, is what we will see happening in other provinces where, for example, in Macedonia, where after the right after the organization of the province, you have uh, this sort of uh, huge, I mean, massive uh, questorial coinage. In that case, with the name of the questors, here in this case, and sorry, I will just a moment resume and show you the slide so that you can see. You see, this is exactly the coin I'm showing you. These are the types. And uh, what is interesting, and you can see here some uh, I'll show you in a second. You can see that uh, Suzanne show. Uh, thank you. Suzanne showed that, uh, um, especially on the rivers, you can see traces of the undertype, and this was uh, a coin of Yero uh, uh, Yero uh, the second. Now we know that at the same time uh, that the Romans uh, had begun striking, for example. Uh, quadrantes on the coinage of Yero II, okay, already during the Second Punic War. So we're talking about uh, 20, yeah, uh, 20 years earlier than that. So the coins of Yero II were kept being uh, overstruck. And uh, um, also after, of course, the, uh, insti the institution of the province of uh, Sicily, which was the first province of uh, uh, the Roman Empire. Okay. Um, now, this is uh, another one that I want to show you, the so-called wreath series. Here, sorry. Oh, and I just want to show you also the PowerPoint while we are at this, the so-called brief series with the magistrate possibly Quintus Babius. Uh, again, this is, and you see there is the sort of complete, um, there is uh, clearly a denominational uh, uh, system here in place. Um, and we have one here. And uh, Oh, let's see what I can show you more. You, we have also the warrior series, and then in a second I will show you some of them. And uh, what is very important, and once again, is that uh, uh, Suzanne was excavated. Uh, if you, uh, Suzanne, would you like to tell them how you got to this idea of how you, uh, how you identified the areas of production for these uh, coins, because this is really your work. Well, it's not uh, very difficult. It's uh, just a spread map. Actually, this is the extension of the reef area. Mm -hmm. uh, this in the northwest is of the Panormi town series with the warriors. So here we have Lilibeon as the center. And at the time, I thought also there might be a third one. But thanks to Rick's coins, this uh, map is now uh, overseeded by, I would say, one which uh, needs only these two areas here. But then we have other local types here, one in Solunt, one in uh, Monteyato and then one in Agrigentum, and they are all linked either by uh, common magistrates' names or by uh, common engravers, or then even by common dials. So this is really something fantastic we can here show for the first time uh, in the Roman um, provincial coinage. I think Clive could also probably show a similar start uh, of coinage during the Second Punic War and slightly later. But here with these local magistrates, it's something they replicate also probably from Rome with these names. 
but which appear clearly in a Hellenistic manner in the form of monograms. And uh, they fill also the dates are from the stratigraphic contexts. Uh, so we have roughly 190, 280, uh, all the way through 240, 130, uh, which is really a, a good uh, indication for a start with Latin names first and the Greek ones, those with the Greek legend are later. And uh, logically uh, research until now thought it was the opposite. But I, I will stop here because we have plenty of other yeah, points. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, but I just, uh, I just wanted to really do, I mean, this is your work. Yeah, thank you very and much. Uh, uh, and I just want you to make sure you get uh, the and and I will have of course uh, um, I know that Clive is also on the call so but later on uh, so and uh, I just just because I love it uh, I just wanted to show you this other coin also issued in Lilibeus Lilibeum sorry by Atratinus next uh, uh, long table about the East will talk about a lot about. Uh, Lucius Sempronius Atratinus, which was one of the prefecti of Mark Antony, responsible for one of the issues of the fleet coinage, for uh, coinage, uh, uh, coinage also in Entella, but also coinage, uh, uh, coinage in, uh, um, in Asia Minor, we don't know where, and also in Sparta. But this is beautiful, I just want to see the, show you this other one with the tripod and with the name of uh, Atratinus. So again, please uh, notice uh, the beauty of the fact that you have uh, uh, this really gradual, romanization is a bad word, we don't use it. I mean, it sort of seems like this sort of inculturation, but really the gradual, Okay, appearance of more and more Roman elements, okay, on, uh, on the coin, okay, on these coins. And here, of course, with other than it, we are in the 30s. But I will now move on, because we have so much to show, uh, to imitations and non-state coinages. Here I quote, uh, uh, Clive Stannard uh, from the introduction actually to his section in uh, the Wichonke catalog, uh, which talks about a very important element, which was the lack of small change, which is, of course, he talks about it for what concerns Central Italy, but clearly uh, we can definitely apply that to Spain uh, as well. And, uh, these are these non-state issues, so these are not issues that, they're not counterfeits, these are issues that in some cases imitate Roman coinages, in some cases they don't imitate Roman coinages, they're clearly local, but they, um, they satisfy the need for small change. I know that we are very late, and again, but you can see the Spanish imitations of Roman Republican coinage. This is an, of course, the great expert on this is Pere Pauri Polles, who also published together with Rick on the imitations of Roman semises, but also he published with Manuel Gosalbes about the Republican as the, the imitation, Spanish imitation of Roman Republican assets. You can see that these are clearly not Roman, so there is no attempt at deceiving, and they were produced in Spain um, beginning in the, uh, in the second century, in the mid second century uh, BC. So after the end, let's say, of the copious production of bronze, of Roman bronze coinage, um, you can see that they have, they are, several of them are actually um, uh, pretty heavy, even heavier than the 
uh, UNCAL standard that you can, uh, that, that would need to be applied in this case, as you can see from some examples. Here you see the weights exactly of the uh, unofficial Roman Republican asses. So with some very few exceptions, these are the groups, uh, uh, the groups of course of Pere Pau and Manuel Gonzalez in 2016. As you can see, they are above or anyway around the Uncial uh, standard. Now I'll just uh, stop, uh, sorry, uh, stop the sharing a moment and I'll just show, want to show you two of these which are just fun. One of these uh, uh, is this one here. Uh, no, just a second, it's just too big. Uh, just, uh, no, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, there you go. So, um, I don't, why do you see it? Uh, I see it uh, upside down. I don't know, it's become specular. Anyway, I'll just adjust here. Uh, here you see, you see the brow and you see the star. It's very beautiful. Look at the other side. I don't know. It's just now, okay, yes. Okay, now it's better. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So do you see this uh, us here? Beautiful, interesting. Look at the manufactured, of course they are cast. That's very interesting because uh, these are imitations and they are all cast instead of being struck. Uh, these are uh, other semises. I'll just go, um, I just want to show you, which is very, according to you, fantastic, the evolution of uh, the imitations uh, of uh, Spanish uh, semises uh, here. You see, uh, it's very beautiful to see how less Roman they look uh, while progressing. And of course, we have a decrease uh, in uh, standard. So they began basically looking like, uh, almost like uh, uh, Roman semises, or anyway, very good quality, as you can see here. And then they went on, you see, looking less and less Roman, while still, of course, being seen and circulating uh, with other issues, also other local issues, which were like semises. And uh, we know that they circulated together. All of them circulated absolutely together. It's interesting, uh, tells you that they didn't care. So this is like a token coinage. It doesn't matter. I mean, the assets actually also always maintained uh, these, uh, um, this beauty, this, uh, this weight. But for the semises, you have progressive poor quality. And uh, these are slides of peripower of uh, you have uh, uh, decrease in weight. But what I would like you to notice here, and this was a very important point of Perebauri Bolles that he will make also in a forthcoming paper him, is that the asses, in this case we have the number of coins recorded, and the semises, in this case we have the die study of these, are issued in enormous numbers because you see that they are basically they are issued in a, in a number comparable to mid-size uh, mints in Spain. So which means that this is not only a tolerated um, phenomenon, it's much more than this. Now we are already over time I don't have time, unfortunately, to address uh, uh, the dash on coinages, but since Clive is on the call, I think uh, we, I will uh, end, unfortunately, today. And then uh, next time, we will begin with the Dacian and Eraviscan imitations, which are absolutely amazing. 
I just want to show you some of the coins uh, uh, that have been um, studied for decades by Clive, which they an absolute ground uh, breaking work on them, the non state coinages of Italy. As you see, he is the first one who ever did um, uh, a division, basically, an organization in groups uh, of all these non state coinages, which clearly are not issued by any civic mint. Okay, it's possible some of them were issued in Milturne, in Pompeii, but they don't have the names of the city, of the civic mint on. So in some way, there are unofficial issues and could be considered non-state issues. So I will uh, begin showing you so some of these uh, important coins, so as I said, just very, very few of them. Um, so the, the huge question here is how the Romans addressed, how, oh, sorry, the people, people in the Roman provinces or in Italy addressed the lack of small change that on the contrary was clearly needed for daily transaction. So um, Clive found, uh, found that some of these uh, were, for example, addressed by importing, uh, importing some coins from other massive blocks, basically, of coins, for example, like the ones from Kos, that then were, as you see, overstruck with Roman types. So this is clearly bronze, but the over here, as you, you can hardly make here, a uh, she-wolf, okay? But this is she wolf, so this is uh, like the, the model for this, the prototype, uh, would be the denarius, uh, or, oh sorry, the denarius of uh, Faustulus. I just want to show you the coin here. Okay, this is the uppers, and this is the reverse, and you can see these. Uh, very, very crude representation of uh, the she-wolf. And underneath, you can clearly see that this has been overstruck over cos coinage, coin coinage. And then I'll just show you the next one, because it's important that you see first the, this other one, which was uh, issued uh, possibly in Pompeii, exactly, so-called pseudo-mint. So those are, um, so there, there are these non-state coinages that are imitating uh, coinage issued by other cities. For example, we have Pseudopanormus. Suzanne and Clive published a very important paper uh, in 2008 uh, and 2013, I think, about exactly this. I just want to show you this pseudo ebusan coin that we have here that you will see in the, you see this very, very rudimental bass. And uh, last thing, because then I'll, uh, unfortunately, I, we are over time here. Um, you have uh, uh, it's fantastic. Another non-state issue here. A clock one. No, this is the Panther. Let's see. No, I don't have this one. I did not find it here. But I will show you this next next one, which are a lot. Um, Clive and other uh, and other. Uh, important scholars like uh, Sinner, uh, Ferrante, and so um, found out that there is a similarity in types uh, uh, between non-state coinages in the Betica, in the Spain, in, so in Spanish, uh, in the Spanish province, and Central Italy. This could be explained clearly with trade relationship between uh, the two. 
and that's why you see this is called these are called Italo-Vatican issue. And much more important, of course, uh, the trade, especially we're talking about possibly wine. And uh, I just want to show you uh, one of these uh, these Italo-Vatican issues uh, are done uh, are uh, realized their cast uh, mostly not sorry some of them are cast most of them are struck as in this case because this is an overstrike and this was in, in this case lead so, so some of them are in bronze some of them are in lead possible a by of course lead is an important byproduct of silver smelting so of course you you can speak think about the silver mines in Spain, the silver mines of the Vatica, where sal several of these tokens have been found. This is one of them, but uh, Clive uh, identified uh, Minturne as one of the mints issuing uh, some of these uh, coins. I just want to show you one of these coins. Uh, uh, with a very, very typical type for the Italo-Vatican issues, which is the so-called Furnacator, uh, previously known as the man with the shovel, um, which had been, of course, previously interpreted as a minor. Um, but here the Furnacator is somebody who works in a kiln, in a Furnax, here. And this is what you can see. I just, uh, just last one, because it's just fantastic. This is another issue of Minturne. You can clearly see uh, this is a sextant, because Minturne also not only issued these Italo-Vatican issues, but also issued the so-called Roman, Roman style uh, coinages. This is a sextant, as you can clearly see. But look at the reverse. This has been addressed by Clive in a paper of 2021. Please uh, notice uh, that while you can see the denominational mark, you can clearly see the undertype, which is uh, the, um, the anthropocephalus, so basically the, uh, the bull with a uh, human face, which is Naples. So this is overstruck on Neapolitan issues, which gives you really the idea of all these coinages circulating together. And I will end this presentation. So because if, if you have questions and you want to stay on questions, please uh, uh, you tell me, tell me. I, I'm absolutely available, but I don't want to keep you. I just want you to show you this incredible thing. Sorry. Um, these are always part of the, um, they are both part, uh, but we have more in the Wichonke collection, of the Italo-Vatican issues. But you can see that they are completely different beasts in some way. You can recognize the same Furnacator that we saw in the Minturnean uh, lead issue, but clearly, this is a huge thing. These are over 300 grams uh, of bronze. And you can clearly also see your PS. So several people, these are what we call the plomos monetiformes. So the lead that look like coinage. These are huge pieces, uh, mostly found in the Batica. And you can see here PS. This has been uh, interpreted already back with Garcia Bellido in 1986, uh, Publica Suchietas. So possibly this uh, has to be interpreted, this token, beautifully done, has to be interpreted as um, private currency within uh, a Suchietas that was, uh, a Suchietas that was possibly administrating not only um, not only mines, uh, uh, but also, imagine, agricultural lands. And, for example, in the case of this, is fantastic. Look at this. You have this, uh, this man here, and you can see here, you, lead, you read uh, Luso, and you see these names, Coglio, the Kelly, for example, were very important uh, uh, traders 
which were based in the Vatica. So perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps this was private currency which had to do with these, um, with these people. These, uh, and this other one is beautiful just because you see the Eros, uh, Eros which is leading a chariot with a dolphin. Uh, this is uh, the only one. There is no other plomos known. So now... Uh, Lucia, okay. should we yeah, do uh, some Yeah, it's over time, so I'm done. Yeah, okay. Very good. Um, we, yeah. we have run over a bit. Um, we yes. can take maybe one question, perhaps, if there is a question that somebody is, is uh, wanting to answer and, or ask, and um, I'm sure there probably are quite a few, but um, a lot of material here. Anyway, uh, if there are no questions, because of course we are over time, uh, I want to thank you, all of you, and special and um, the fellow contributors to the catalog for uh, attending this talk. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you are very welcome to write to me. And uh, the catalog is coming out, it will be out. Uh, been published in uh, late uh, January, so we will have it, uh, and then you can see more of this, uh, and we will have uh, another uh, talk uh, in March, exactly. Yeah. So on March 1st, so in case you need, uh, because we have to see the other part, and also we I still show just small part of this. Okay. Well. Thank you again, Lucia, and um, thank you everyone for joining us today for the final long table of 2023. Uh, we wish you the happiest holidays and a happy new year and look very much forward to seeing you again in 2024. So.